can see your smiling faces. Jeff and, and Charlie and Sue and Tom. <laughs> Well, while we wait for uh, probably more people will show up, um, maybe um, we'll go around and just say hello and, and our name and um, the Atlas Atlas team folks can, can do that. And um, just say like where you're located if you're a regional coordinator. Um, so I'll start, I'm uh, Julie Hart, I'm the program coordinator. And I am working um, the New York National Heritage Program and uh, based out of Albany. So we're in upstate New York. Jared, can you go? Yep, I'm Jared Fira. Um, I'm the assistant coordinator also out of Albany and through the New York Natural Heritage Program. Um, Jeff, looks like you're unmuted. Okay, um, I'm Jeff Bolsinger. I'm one of the regional coordinators for the Northern Region, and I live in Canton. And Tom, why don't you go, since you also live in Canton. <laughs> yeah, Tom Wheeler. I'm uh, one of the regional coordinators for the Northern Region, also live in Canton. And Charlie? Hi, Charlie Scheim. I live in Oneonta, and I'm a regional coordinator for the Central Region but I mostly focus on the Eastern half of the central region. And Ann. Hi, I'm Ann Swain, uh, regional coordinator, mostly the Southern half of the Hudson region. I think I got everyone. Cool. Awesome. Well, um, I wanted to just spend a few minutes talking about um, some of the, the early spring breeders. So I think in the first year of the Atlas, I put together um, a, a guide for the early breeders. So that species that start breeding between January and April. Um, so that's a lot of your, um, you know, great horned owl, barred owl, um, a lot of the um, corvids, so ravens and crows and jays, and um, let's see what else, bald eagle, um, some of our um, city birds, so starlings and um, house sparrows and stuff, and, and then a few other random things, so things like uh, horned lark start really early, and also um, the crossbills would fall in that period. Um, but so this time I wanted to, I'm extending that a little bit and I'm going to, I, um, am doing species that typically start breeding in these first two weeks of May. Um, so that's what I'm calling early spring. Um, so to kind of extend that early guide that I had put together. Um, so this isn't going to include those earlier species um, will just be the new ones that you would add in coming in the next two weeks. Although I know that a lot of birds have been arriving early, so things may be a little off this year, um, but we'll um, go with the average arrival times is what I'm basing this on. So let me just share my screen. And I only have a few slides. It's not like last week where I talked for like half an hour. Um, I just, let's see, I have a few tips to go over for some of these species. Is that the right screen sharing? Yes, great. Make it full screen. There we go. Um, so yeah, so like I said, this is species that are usually hey, hey, Julie, start. Yeah. Okay. Were you gonna record this or no? It should be recording. Oh, I didn't see that. Sorry, I missed that code. I beg your pardon. Uh, is it? Let me just double check. Yeah, it looks like it is, Julie. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I have it set up to automatically record. So I don't even have to remember because <laughs> I, I always forget. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so yeah, so we'll um, just talk really quickly about a few of these species. Um, and I'll start with some of the waterfowl uh, species that we have. And waterfowl that are, are breeding this time of year um, generally have two different approaches to nesting. So some of them are doing using these marshy mounds that they build or that they, you know, build on top of like a muskrat or a beaver lodge type thing. And then we have other waterfowl that are using cavities. Um, and courtship usually for a lot of these species doesn't take place in the same location where they're actually breeding. Um, so that's useful information for us. You can you can report the, the courtship. Um, it helps us know where those birds are spending time during their wintering season, during migration, and in what areas they're using to develop those pair bonds with their mates. Um, but what we also really want to know is where they're actually nesting so that we can get this breeding distribution information. So for that, uh, we do, um, I, I tend to focus on for these, this group of species, I focus on the nest building, um, birds that are incubating for the, the mound nesters, and then the young birds. That's probably the easiest way to confirm breeding for these species. Um, a kind of an interesting little tidbit for a lot of these waterfowl species, they don't develop a brood patch naturally. So a lot of the passerine species, you know, if you're catching them, uh, misnetting them, you might know you often blow on their, their breasts so you can see their brood patch and see how far along they are. And that's kind of a, a hormonally driven process. Um, but for a lot of the waterfowl, they don't have that. And instead what they do is they pull those feathers out themselves um, and they create the brood patch themselves. And then they use all of those downy feathers to, to line the nest. So that's what you're, you're seeing when you see all those feathers in their nest. That's, that's them pulling out those feathers and developing a brood patch. So kind of a cool thing. Um, all right, and so the species that we're, I'm referring to here for this early part of the season, um, we have the mound nesters would be mute swan, which are kind of everywhere, um, trumpeter swan, not so common, but expanding in New York, Canada goose, which is pretty obvious. They nest out in the open and you can see them really easily. Um, they're, I think they're one of the most commonly um, confirmed species for the atlas. Mallards um, tend to be a little harder to find their nest and they, um, but, but they're, it's really easy to see their young. So they're also pretty easy to, to confirm. Um, common eider only nest on Plum Island and Fisher's Island in the Long Island Sound. So only if you're down there would you really be looking for them. And then there's a couple of cavity nesters. So we have hooded mergansers and wood ducks. And uh, both of them will use natural cavities or artificial nest boxes as well. So um, kind of interesting, but you'll see them, you know, this time of year and probably the last couple of weeks, um, you may have seen them. They'll be flying around a, as a pair and flying through the forest and, they'll be landing in the trees and, and maybe like going into little um, cavities in the trees and stuff. So that's how, that's how you'll know that they're looking for a nest in that area. Kind of fun. All right, coastal marsh birds, they arrive early because they're further south on Long Island. It's a little bit warmer and more mild weather there. Um, so we get some of these marsh birds come in coming already and, and setting up to, to breed. Um, so these are mostly species on Long Island, but the, some of them will come up a little bit up into the Hudson uh, estuary, just like a little bit north of the city. Um, many of them are colonial or loosely colonial as well. So you tend to kind of know if you find one, you're gonna find more than one. And they, tend to nest in two different categories. They're either in trees or they're on or near the ground. 
And for a lot of these species, the, the easiest things, again, it would be your courtship, um, finding the actual nests for particularly for the, the birds that nest in trees and then um, fledged young as well. So for these species, um, for the on or near the ground nesting birds would be your clapper rail and oyster catcher. Oyster catchers are, you know, right on the sand. They'll be right out in the open. Um, and, but clapper rails are more hidden. They make these little elevated platforms in the reeds, just like other rails do. Um, so you're probably not going to see one of their nests, but what you will see is the little black rail babies in the, when they finally hatch and leave the nest, and they're super cute. Um, I don't really know how to identify little black rail babies. They all look the same to me. So I would look for the adults with them in order to ID. So, um, and then there's some uh, some other waders that are nesting in trees. So it's all of your, your herons and egrets and, and glossy ibis. Um, and I will note that um, I was trying to find photos for this presentation and there were zero glossy ibis nests, zero tricolored heron, zero snowy egret nests in Macaulay Library for the Atlas. So if any of you are down there in that area and you happen to see um, a heron colony or egret colony, um, try to get some photos. We could use them. Uh, this photo is, I think, from Florida. All right, and then we have the inland marsh birds. So those that are using primarily freshwater areas. Um, and these birds can have any variety of nest types. They can be on the ground, up in trees. They can be like midway up the vegetation, building a, a, your typical passerine or songbird cup nest. Um, and the easiest codes for these birds would be looking for the courtship right now or um, nest building. So carrying nesting material is probably the easier one. Um, and then later in the season, when they're carrying food and, and feeding the young, um, those would be the, the keys there. Um, so for the inland marsh birds, the ground nesters, you've got the sandhill crane, which is another species that is expanding quite rapidly in New York, which is very exciting and cool, I think. Um, and Wilson snipe. Also not very many photos of them either. Um, of their nest or their young. So you see them, that might be a cool addition to the database. Um, and then you've got the, the gray blue herons. And, you know, they're one that we haven't really totally figured out how we're going to treat them in the end because they often are nesting in these big rookeries. Um, but in some places, like in the Adirondacks, you'll get just one pair on, on a lake. Um, so uh, definitely, you know, keep an eye out no matter where you are and, and at least report them and um, we'll figure out how to, how to handle those later on. Um, and then you have some of your the songbird cup nesters, um, which are starting up already. So these are your red winged blackbird, common grackle, song sparrow. Um, they've been around already for at least a month and they've been on territories I've been seeing lots more female blackbirds and grackles lately. So, so they are getting ready real soon. Raptors, um, generally you can split them into the forest raptors or the open habitat raptors, kind of a general split that you can do. Um, and for any sort of um, Spe whatever species you're, you're looking for or thinking might be present, um, it's really good to consider as well how much prey there might be available nearby. Um, so if it's, um, uh, let's see, I don't know, short-eared owls, um, you'd, you'd want to make sure that there were um, lots of voles and mice and stuff around in, the, in like a large grassland. Um, there's only like one or two places in the state where they're actually breeding anymore, but um, just as an example. Um, a lot of these raptors are doing these aerial courtship displays. So 
a lot of them at the very least you'll see um, flying in pairs and they'll be like synchronized and, and copying each other. Um, a lot of them also are going to be um, kind of fighting, tussling with each other in the air and passing food from one to the other. Um, that's also a sign that they're recording and they're showing off how agile they are and how much, how well they can provide food. Um, the adults are responsive to playback, which we don't really recommend using playback too much, but um, um, it has proven really useful for finding goshawks. That seems to be the one that's managed the most success. So um, yeah, but it's much easier to find the young. So once the young get to a certain age, they get really, really loud and they'll be just like calling incessantly from, from their nests. So um, some of these species here, we've got um, forest raptors would be red-shouldered hawk, cooper's hawk, long-eared owl, uh, northern sawa owl. More open areas, you have the osprey, northern harrier, short-eared owl. And then merlin are kind of in between. They can be using a cavity in a tree. They can be building a stick nest. They can be on the edge of, in the middle of a park. They can be in the forest. So they're kind of like all over the place. So you just have to, if you see a merlin, you keep an eye out for them. They're kind of cool that way. And that is another species that's expanding in New York. We have a lot of cavity nesters. They can, they can start up early, um, earlier than a lot of the other birds because they've got those cavities. They're not as exposed to the temperature fluctuations and the spring rains and things like that. So it's a little easier for them to get going, and get nesting a little sooner than, than other species. Um, these can be birds that are using artificial or natural nests. Um, obviously it's hard to see in the nest. So what you're looking for is behaviors outside the nest. So you're looking for the courtship, um, building nest, which the, they will still bring material into the nest to, to line um, the area where the young are, where the eggs are and where the young are. Um, and then you'll see them later on feeding, carrying food in. And um, you might actually see the, the young ones when they get to be fledglings sticking their head out of the nest cavity. So that's pretty cool. Um, uh, another thing that I do recommend, if you see like a really fresh woodpecker hole or you're seeing uh, some other like cavity that looks really promising, you can, you know, find some place to sit for 20 minutes and just like back off and sit under a tree and kind of hide yourself and wait and see what comes in. And, and that can be a good way to, to see um, if somebody is there because they will be coming around regularly when they're building their nest and, and feeding. Um, and then later in the season, you're gonna hear a lot, the, again, those, the young birds that are calling really loudly. And that's particularly true for um, the woodpeckers, like that's how I find most woodpecker nests is by hearing the young birds begging and begging and begging nonstop. Um, even when the parents are nowhere around, they just beg and beg and beg and beg. So, so that's a great way to find them. Um, kingfishers, that's another one where I might stake out if I saw like a really good looking hole in a sandbank. Um, I would probably sit and watch that hole and check on it periodically. If I didn't find one one day, I might go back you know, a few days later or something and, and stake it out again and see, see if you could find it, um, birds going in there. Um, Top to titmouse is another one that's starting up. Um, chickadees are also busy. Um, those are in the, they, they start even earlier. Um, then, Artificial nest users in New York State, I don't know of any purple martins that are not using an artificial nest box. Um, there's very few places left in the US to 
my knowledge, that where they actually use uh, natural cavity. Um, but they they do seem to take really well to to the artificial boxes. Um, and then you have tree swallows and bluebirds, which will use ether. Oh, they're pretty flexible. All right, and then the open habitats. Um, so this is mostly your like grassland type birds. And a lot of these species are in steep decline. So it's really important that we do document them. Um, it's doubly important because a, a lot of the grassland habitat is now being developed for solar and wind energy. And we wanna make sure that we don't put, put those up where there's critical grassland habitat. So, um, so it's really important that we try to document as many grassland birds as we can. Um, and sometimes um, it's the grassland birds tend to, tend to have these really high pitched, thin sounds that they're making songs. Um, and they can be hard to hear during the day, either because of traffic or wind or um, just other bird songs. Um, so sometimes you can go out at night and a lot of them are singing also at night. Um, and if you do that, then you'll know, oh, these birds are actually in this field. And then you can come back during the daytime and actually look for them flying around and carrying nesting material or carrying food. So that's a much safer way to uh, confirm that they're breeding somewhere than going through the nest and flushing them and potentially trampling on their nest. We don't want that. So, um, so that, that's kind of a, a cool little strategy for them, a little tip for them. Um, so we have already here, we have meadowlarks, Bobolinks aren't back yet, to my knowledge, and they won't start breeding right away. Um, loggerhead shrike is one that is, there's there been a couple sightings this spring, so, um, but they haven't been documented breeding for, since the last atlas, um, so for 20 years, so it's, but it's, they're, they're one species that tends to move around and they do um, we do get a few individuals every year, so it's always worth keeping an eye out for them. If you do see a shrike, definitely, um, definitely report it and, and try to, to visit it frequently. Um, and then obviously kill deer, and they're already on their nests, um, at least around here. Um, and last but not least, residential birds. So. I really like starting people out, people who are new to atlasing or new to watching bird behaviors. Watching the birds in your neighborhood is one of the easiest ways to really get familiar with behaviors of birds. Um, so if you're not used to seeing what courtship um, looks like, or you know, like when they feed, when a, like a male cardinal is feeding the female, if you've never seen that before, um, and a lot of species are doing that, um, it's, it's a really easy way to watch some backyard feeders somewhere um, and, and get familiar with a lot of the, the core breeding behaviors that will translate to other species and other groups. So kind of gives you that little head start um, is what I like to say. Um, and they're just much easier to encounter because they're, they're right where we're living, right? So we tend to cross paths with them on our way to work or when we're walking our dog or just hanging out in our yard or going to a park or something. So, so they give us a lot of opportunities to, to, to study them. Um, and I wanted to point out one thing that if you, for cowbirds um, particularly, um, a lot of people are, you end up seeing a cowbird egg, say in a phoebe nest, um, but you don't see any cowbirds around, then in eBird, in order to document that, um, you would enter a zero for the count of cowbirds, and then you would enter the, the code. So you, then you would do nest with eggs for that. Um, so it's a, just a little trick that you have to enter that zero if you don't see any cowbirds on your checklist. Um, so yeah, so here we've got the brown-headed cowbird, the Phoebe, the Robin, 
Um, and then also Eurasian collar dove, which is one that um, does breed in a few uh, urban areas across the state. So one to just keep an eye out. I think probably some of them go undetected because people aren't really paying attention to morning doves and they look pretty similar. They sound different, um, but they, they look superficially similar. So, um, so yeah. And, and then I just wanted to end really quickly with some general tips, um, some of the resources that I recommend people use to, to support their atlasing and become better atlasers. Um, so first thing, this type of this time of year, you're really looking for courtship, during nesting material, and nest building. Um, and then it helps to know what species to expect in any different part of the state where you are, and also what habitats each bird is using. And um, so there are some resources to, to get you that information. So you can see the distribution on, on the Atlas website or from the previous Atlas books, if you have those. Um, and then you can get habitat information from all about birds. And I always have the Audubon app. This Audubon has a free bird app as well. And I have that on my phone because that has a lot of the um, behavior and habitat information and also like what food they're eating. So, so it has a lot more of that life history information that, um, that you don't get in Merlin. Um, so I do recommend having that on your phone as well. Um, but then for learning their songs and calls, um, including some of the juvenile songs, um, I do use or recommend Merlin and the Audubon app. Um, they, they have different um, recordings on both of those resources. They don't really, they don't have, they have, yeah, different people providing those sound, sound files. So they, you get more variety if you're using both apps. And then um, it can also be helpful to, to use the Macaulay Library and Zeno Canto, which um, both have a lot of audio recordings. Um, and then in terms of learning more about courtship and some of the other behaviors, um, there are some websites that are helpful. So All About Birds has some basic information. Birds by Bent, um, that's a, an old book series that um, has been put online. So you can search for that and find that online. Um, Birds of the World is probably the more, most definitive resource that's available, but you do have to pay for it, although you do get a discount by uh, being an eBird user. So um, if you do sign up for that, I think it's like $50 a year. Um, uh, so that's another resource. And then I do use a number of books as well. There's some, some new books that have come out recently that talk about um, different fledglings. Um, the, the new Peterson's Nest Guide is amazing. It has multiple photos of all the different species that are breeding in North America. Um, the Stokes Behavior Guides, those came out like in the 80s, 90s, um, but still have a lot of really relevant information that um, I find quite handy. So here, that's, that's what I wanted to say. And I talked for half an hour again. You did get one question to Julie uh, at the start. So, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Where is it? Um, uh, it's the very first one there, or I can read it if it's easier. A uh, pair of kestrels copulating. What type of tree would they nest in? Uh, hmm. Oh, sorry. I thought you were wanting people to answer in chat. So I threw some answers down below. <laughs> do you oh. know, do you know, Anne, are they mostly in deciduous trees? I feel yeah, like they're deciduous trees. I didn't know if she knew that, that they are, they are cavity nesters. So it's going to be a oh, yeah. standing tree with a hole that, that might've been a good place to start, but I didn't know if that was necessary. Yeah, um, sorry. And I a lot of times I'll see them in, you know, standing trees that don't have bark that have been stripped down and 
have a good size hole in them. Yeah, um, they like snags a lot, I, I would yeah. say. Dead, yeah. dead trees, yeah. 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 In terms of the height and size of the hole, that's why I linked the Nest Watch info, because Nest Watch has some good info there on size of hole and height. Yeah, it's like a couple inches, I think, right? Inches diameter. Yeah. Hole. Yep. Um, they do sometimes use artificial nest boxes. You can build boxes and hang them up. Um, yeah, that's. Dan, are you speaking to us or somewhere else? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm muted. I'm around brushed and somebody put them on telephone poles for like about three miles or something in several boxes. So I confirmed a bunch really easily, but they do nice. take boxes pretty regularly. Where was that? Yeah, yeah. where was that? Around Brushton and in, in Franklin County. Wow. Yeah. Was, hey. I don't know who did it? But somebody it was on a mission. Yeah. yeah, you'll you'll notice too, like along highways, they put up on the the back of the highway signs, like that tell you Albany is coming in twenty miles. Like those big signs on the back of those, they often have kestrel boxes as well. So you'll see, um, see a lot of kestrels sometimes along highways too. Uh, so, Dan, that was Mark Mansky that put up all those Kestrel boxes. Oh, really? In okay. County. And he was banding them and studying them. Cool. Nice. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> this is Kathy. I have a question on the birds by bent. How, mm. do, you, how do you use that? i just looking that up. Yeah. So if you get to the home page, it's kind of an old website, but if you get to the home page, let's see, it's gonna give you the index. That's the easiest way. So I'll put it in the chat. There's a link to Oh, I see. Um, so you would pick the the species that you're interested in, and then and then they do break it up into different, um, you know, the behaviors that you're likely to see, what courtship looks like, things like that. So they do have a lot of oh. information. Okay, that's good. I have birds of the world, and I I like that. Yeah, birds that. of the world would be more current, but it has less um, less like anecdotal information and sometimes that anecdotal information is uh like i think that's also how the stokes guide is kind of written as well as a little bit more anecdotal it's like what you're actually seeing in the field rather than birds of the world which is written in like a very like scientific researchy type language so um can be a little more accessible to, to use these other sources yeah okay thank you i kind of mm -hmm. snuck in here from pennsylvania i got you I got your invitation, but Great. we're doing the breeding bird atlas next year. Next year, yeah, I know. So maybe I got. I'm not sure how I got on your thing, but I was on. I was in New York last summer, and we would have put on that's, the bird. So that's, that's all. That's how you got that's, in. That's how you got in. <laughs> well, thank well, you. Well, we welcome people from anywhere. So if you have other birder friends in Pennsylvania or any anywhere. Um, no, my brother in, in Maryland, he's been doing the Maryland ones. Yeah. And then when we in New York, he said, Oh, New York has it also. So he was, I was following him around and he was showing me how uh how to find find different things. So yeah, great. Awesome. Yeah. How many years do you do the New York Atlas? Five. And this is year four. Oh. So we have two more years to go. We have a lot, a lot to do, but we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, I have to figure out the grids. That that one I I'll have to see how that works to stay mm -hmm. in one grid or whatever. Yeah, the 
the eBird app is really helpful for that. So the eBird app, if you have it in the Atlas portal, that's step one. And then, um, then when you're in the using the app and you have a checklist going, it will show you on the map where you're located. Um, and it will also give you an alert and tell you, hey, you're getting close to a block boundary or hey, you just left your block. Um, so <laughs> It, it's really helpful now. Um, it wasn't like that when we started the Atlas, but last year they added those features and it's super helpful. So, um, oh, so yeah, okay. much easier. Mm -hmm. So you're on eBird and then you go to a, it says Atlas. Yeah, yeah. there's an Atlas portal in the settings. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, okay. and, and then you're set. So it, Pennsylvania will be the same way. So um, yeah. Great. <laughs> I see some people are asking about technicians as well. Um, yeah, we are going to have four technicians this summer. Um, all of them will be based around in the Adirondacks. So hopefully we'll get lots of coverage this year. Um, we have uh, one of our technicians from last year is returning. I don't know if you want to introduce yourself or not. You can. <laughs> No, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so any other questions? Like could be about what I presented or could be technical issues. It could be, I don't know, some other observation that you saw lately and you're not sure how to how to code it or report it, um, anything like that. I've got I've got one for you, Julie. Oh boy, this is gonna be the other a hard day one. I then. saw a pair of mallards copulating. Uh, yes, a male black duck was trying to insert himself in between the male and the female. <laughs> yeah, and this went on for quite a while. <laughs> so obviously, I know how to code the the mallards. Do I code the black duck? And if so, how? I mean, I guess it's. Part of courtship, huh? Well, it obviously had courtship on its mind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we do have, so there's only a few um, species pairs where we um, actually map hybrids, but that is one of the hybrids that we do map um, is, is mallard black duck hybrids. So not that that's a hybrid, but, <laughs> um, right, right. but yeah, I think, I think I would I would report courtship for both species. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was kind of what I was thinking, but it was sort of like, yeah, you know, that's kind of a strange. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the same as like a cowbird putting its egg yeah. in yeah. another species nest and you're you're reporting nests with eggs for both species. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Now, if you see some golden wing bluings hybrids doing that, I yeah, I don't know how you report it. Well, they're a mess. Yeah. <laughs> more questions? It's got to be more questions out there. Yes, John. Just a question on what I saw, you know, when I was reading the email, it says any singing bird to record it. So a singing bird that's out of its breeding range or out of its nesting range, should I still include the singing bird, even if it's something that's going to basically be up in the, going up to the boreal forest, to, but it's singing mm -hmm. still here on Long Island? Yep. Like, yeah, that like is. The white, -throated, the white throated sparrows, I know, are continually singing as they're, but so I should count them also. And the, the white crown sparrow that I've had for the whole winter on and off has been singing away. So usually it's like when he starts singing, it's, he's getting ready to leave. But he's been quite vocal the last you know, few like, times he's been around. He's been here for oh, the last, good. Week, last week. So I'm, wait, I'm waiting for them to come up to Albany. <laughs> and it's like, it's, it's, this one stayed for the winter on Long Island. So it was, it's kind of unusual for that. But I, it's been here for the last few years. Also, the, um, the, Blue-headed vireo singing in the, uh, which I still count that as a singing bird. Then also, as long as it's as long as it's singing, just put it down as a singing bird. Yeah, 
Yeah, right. that is that is the guidance that we're giving. Um, that allows us to um, use the data in a very flexible way. So we can look at breeding phenology and see when they actually start singing. We can see when they arrive in the state. Um, but you're right. I mean, it's not indicated. It's not indicative of local breeding. Um, but we do know that for those species that they're not actually breeding in that area. So we can you had actually asked interpret. That earlier. You had answered that question earlier, talking about the ducks and like some of the waterfowl that start their courtship prior to their going to their breeding grounds. And mm -hmm. I said, like last year, I saw juncos, you know, like doing the um, sparrow dance in the courtship, and it was like on Long Island. So I realized that that would be part of it too. Is that if they start doing the like the, the, the little dance with and, and you know strut back and forth, then they're basically looking to find the mate before they just, like fly north. So. I guess that that would be what you also then. Yeah, and 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 honestly, um, that's something that is still fairly poorly understood. Um, is you know which species are developing their pair bonds in migration versus those that form them on the breeding ground. So there's still a lot of species where we don't really know where that's happening or when that's happening in their annual cycle. Um, so it's still really there's still a lot to learn about about the phenology and migration so okay. yeah definitely report report that and then we'll interpret it accordingly Hello. yeah thank you it's a good question um we had something similar uh we had a singing ruby crowned kinglet mm. on long island which none of us had ever heard before if it wasn't for merlin i don't think we would have figured it out <laughs> um, but once once it came up we tracked the bird down and yes they was singing <laughs> yeah yeah i would report it we're inundated yeah. with them right now up here in albany so like you can't go anywhere without hearing them singing um but yeah yeah just report them and i mean they're only breeding at these higher elevations in in the adirondacks and catskills and um, but yeah, it helps us see where they're stopping over in migration. Yeah. Cool. Celia, are you? Oh, yes. Hi. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. I'm just quickly, I'm trying to find the portal for the Atlas on eBird. On the website or in the app? Uh, oh, well, I'm on the website. On the website. So I guess I could look on my app, my phone, but. Um, yeah, it's in, it's, it's different for each um, oh, okay. thing. So you're just going to go, I'll just, I'll put the link in the, in the chat. Unless Jared beat me to it. I was I'm yeah. trying to, but. <laughs> okay. Um, so you're going to go to eber.org and then slash atlas and why and it's the same um formula for any atlas so if you go to north carolina they're doing an atlas it would be atlas nc if okay. you go to maryland it's md well it's actually md dc because they include district of columbia but um but yeah so that's where you would go there and to enter and you would enter data by going to that website first and then doing the submit button okay great Thank and if, you. yeah, and for those who um, don't have their um, smartphone already set up in the portal, um, it's a little different on Android versus iOS. But if you go into the settings, um, you'll find that there is a portal section. And then you'll see there's a whole list of things and you'll see all the different Atlas projects in there. So you would just go scroll down to the New York Reading Bird Atlas um, and then you'll be in the portal. So. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm just gonna include one more link in the chat that has a little bit more of a tutorial on both of those, so how to submit data. All right, so I think, Dan, you were next. Oh. 
Okay, yes, uh, I wanted to add a bird to the early um, arrivals and the nesters and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, I'm kind of obsessed with Louisiana, Louisiana water thrush and determined to find them in my neck up in my blocks. Um, my yes. friend Derek here in Maine uh, just found one on ter territory this week. So uh, it, it was known to have bred there last year. And uh, so that's one I'm going to be looking for next week when I head up to Essex and Franklin County and around there. So that's when we yeah. get very early. And then they, as soon as they nest and everything, they get pretty quiet pretty quick. Yeah. They're very so quiet. It's not a bad yeah. time in the next month. Uh, to go looking for them on basically good brook trout streams. Yep. I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good point. Yeah, that is one that um, they've already arrived on territory around here in Albany. I don't know, Jeff, have they, Jeff and Tom, have they made it all the way up to you guys already? Uh, there was at least one report from Lewis County last week. Yeah, so they're just about all the way throughout the state. Um, yeah, that is definitely another one to to learn. It's really important for that one too to learn the call note. They have a very harsh call note, um, but because they stop singing, they stop singing really early in the morning. They also stop singing pretty soon after they arrive and once they build their nest. Um, so what you're listening for is that call note. That's what you'll. That's the only way to really find them once they've started breeding. Yeah. Um, Sarah. Um, yeah, that's really interesting because I've seen the I've heard them here at BB Hill um, State Forest. Mm. So, so I'm pretty new to all this, and I'm just learning as I go. And I have a priority block near me, which is BB Hill, and I try to get there as regularly as I can. But my question is, mm -hmm. I also have nest boxes on my home property, and I wonder, do you cross reference with Nest Watch to get that data? Or do I need um, to be entering that separately? I I do plan to request the data um, from Nestwatch. I've already, you know, put a word in with Robin Bailey, who runs that project. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm I'm not really expecting to see to find a lot of new records through that because I think a lot of people are also using eBird. Um, so it's, it's up to you. Uh, I would, I would as prefer I get, as I get my speed up in doing this. I'll yeah. Try to, yeah. I'll try to enter those two right now. Yeah. I'm just trying to get to that priority block. Cause I understand that that's the, the biggest focus. So, yes. And I will say that I am scheduled to give a walk there later this summer. I don't know if you had seen that, um, but with Hudson Catherine, Bird Club. Catherine Schneider mentioned that. And just okay, a question on, on that. So, um, you know, I'm I'm learning that I'm going to go back to the place where I heard the, the Louisiana water thrush, and I'm going to go back to the place I saw the Cooper's hawk and see if I can find the nest. But I know you also want to try to cover different habitats within the priority block. So if you could mm -hmm. speak about that a little bit, I mean, how much should I be going back to the same spot or trying to go to a new area in the block? Yeah. Um, yeah, so so one of the, the goals for, for each block is that we sample all the different habitats. So we're trying to get like a good idea of all the different species that are breeding in the block. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's really highly variable depending on the block, what type of access there is, what type of habitat is available. Um, and, and there's just a lot of constraints, but uh, usually I try to find a couple of different locations within each block. So a forest and a, like a cemetery or a school, school or a park or something. Um, and then the grassland I do from the road. Um, but so I try to find a few different habitats, try to access any water that is there, um, whether it's wetland or river or lake or whatever. Um, so I'll definitely, I'll, I'll try to scout out like three to three, four, five locations per block. And then I, I, I go to all of those multiple times. So, yeah. Thanks. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Kathy. 
So um, I have a question about traveling. We'll be going to other states um, next month out west. Would yeah. I be able to, is there a list of states that are doing an atlas or would I just look for the portal when I'd be, I'm, I'm reading uh, Tom Wheeler's um, information about looking at the list of portals. Yeah. Or is there of, of states that are doing the, the atlas this year? Um, I, I happen to know off the top of my head that the only other places out west that are doing atlases are Oklahoma. Um, and they're not using Everd. Um, and uh, Marin County in California. And they're also not using Everd. Um, so those are the, the only two that I know in the Western part of the, the US. Okay, um, so we'll just put in, put in checklists then was I? So along? then you would, yeah, just do Everd, just do a normal Everd checklist for those. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and I'll just mention while we're talking about portals and multiple atlases going on that um, we will we'll be doing the, the big atlas weekend again this year. That'll be the last full weekend in June, so 22nd to 24th. Um, and that's where we do basically, a, a, it's a competition um, and we do it with all the other Atlas projects um, that, that want to participate. So um, this year we're going to go from I'll do north to south. So we're going to have Newfoundland, Ontario, New York, Maryland and DC, North Carolina, and Puerto Rico. So those are all the Atlases that will be participating this year in Big Atlas Weekend. So. If I had my druthers, I'd be going to Puerto Rico <laughs> or Newfoundland. <laughs> no, there's still lots of places I need to explore in New York too. <laughs> Any other questions or and regional coordinators, if you want to add something else that you want to expand on, please feel free. Well, Celia, I'm sorry, I just saw you asked a question early on. Who is the Western coordinator? Livingston County. That's by Rochester. By Rochester. It's uh, south of Rochester, east of Buffalo. And I think I did get someone, a couple people put links in. So. Okay. Yeah. I would contact Sue Barth. Sue. Okay, I did send an email and didn't hear back a few days ago. So I just thought oh. I'd see, but okay. I'll um, try yeah. again. Yeah, I would do super, yeah. If you don't hear anything, you can email me and I can email her. Okay, thanks. When do the uh, new employees start working? <laughs> um, is it May 22nd? Two of them are starting May 22nd, um, Allie included. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think June, June 1st. 1st is for the other two. They both have prior commitments, so they need to start a little late, but yeah. And then they're going till mid, uh, mid August. Yeah, and Allie will probably go up and be Alicing beforehand, anyways. But not going to be a whole lot going on. But you know, <laughs> yeah, some things. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dan. 
Yeah, I thought I might add uh, for the people who are asking about portals, like I come from Maine and I go to New York. Sometimes I forget to change it to the port Atlas portal. You can do that after the fact. If yeah. on eBird, you go mm -hmm. to your checklist and when you open up a list, uh, anyone, you on the right hand corner, there are options and you can drop down and change the portal. Um, I catch myself making that mistake, and, but it's easy to correct. Yeah, yeah there's a, a screenshot of how to do that on the, that link that I put in the chat for submitting data. There's a, there's a screenshot for how to, how to change your portal after the fact. Um, where was I going uh, here to the block sign up? Um, so yeah, Barb asked about, um, block sign up and I, I would say, yes. Yeah, so, so, blah, um, so block sign up is optional. Um, you know, it's not required if you feel like you can't to commit to a whole block and making sure that it gets done, um, then you know you don't don't feel compelled to do it. But if you can sign up for a block, um, that does help us um, that the Atlas team know where people are are spending their time or planning to spend their time so we can send people elsewhere. Um, so yes, I would still recommend if you um, if you are inclined to sign up for a block to please do that again. Um, and I just put the, the link for that in the chat. Wow, I see, I see someone's name on the, on the call who um, lives in Colorado. <laughs> I don't need to mean to, to pick on anyone, but um, there is one person who's kind of, it was known amongst us Atlas coordinators as someone who goes and helps out all these other Atlases. Um, and, and he came here last summer. So he was, if you wanted to speak, you could, but I won't say your name. <laughs> but that's just um, a story like hinting at how for for many of us that alicing becomes very addictive and something that we just like once you start paying attention to behaviors and and like what birds are doing around you and you know like, oh, that cardinal is just barely on nest. And um, and you go back a couple of weeks later and you're like, oh, I know they must have babies now. And like, you know, like once you start doing that, <laughs> it's really hard to stop. So um, so there are lots of us that um, kind of float around. This is, this is the third atlas I've participated in. So um, yeah, we kind of get addicted. <laughs> All right, well, it is eight o'clock. Um, if there's no last minute questions, um, I might sign off and say goodbye, good night. Um, we'll be meeting again in two more weeks. I'll send out another reminder email when it gets closer. And yeah, have fun out there. There's lots of stuff showing up every day. Okay, thanks a lot, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, good night. Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Good